Welcome to Interviewed by a Vampire, and my guest for this very first episode is Derek Pitts. He's the chief astronomer and director of the Fells Planetarium at the Franklin Institute. Since 2009, he's been a NASA Solar System Ambassador, and he was invited to the very first star party at the White House, where he met President Obama. He's been interviewed by Craig Kilborn and my pal Stephen Colbert, and he hosts his own weekly radio talk show called Sky Talk. Welcome, Derek. Thank you for being here. Sure, Patrick. Appreciate my pleasure. You, uh, appreciate you being here for my very first show. Yeah, so we'll I'm see honest. how this Thank goes. you very much. Um, so Derek and I are going to spend the next 60 minutes talking entirely about the TV show Ancient Aliens. So we're going to get into some serious science here. Okay. Uh, no, uh, but I, I, before we, we kind of get into the science, I do have a favor to ask you. Um, I know that you can, you can get this to the right people. This is my application to get into the Space Army. Oh, So, uh, yes. you know, I noticed yeah, Captain Kirk yeah. gets a lot of action, and I figured, you know, I want me some of that. Absolutely. So you bet I can. You can get that to the right person? I know exactly where to take this. No problem. I'll make sure it gets right to the people that count. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll, my pleasure. I'll, I'll, I'll put this, yeah, we'll put that over there. No That's problem. Good. So... In 2009, uh, the UN declared an international year of astronomy, and you were named the U.S. spokesman for that project. Tell me what that entailed. Well, it was a really exciting opportunity for me to help people all around the United States understand a little bit more about astronomy using that platform of the International Year of Astronomy in Space. And it worked out rather well because I had the opportunity to go to a number of conferences, presentations, conventions, meetings, all sorts of things like that, and uh, encourage people to think more about how astronomy fits into their lives. And it's everything from you know, going outside to view the night sky to looking at some of the fantastic information that's available from observatories all over the world online uh, to visiting your local planetarium, to taking kids out to look at the night sky, all of those kinds of things, just to get people, really, Patrick, to look up more. So it's a lot of outreach. It's a tremendous amount of outreach, okay. yes. It really is nothing more. I shouldn't say nothing more. It really is that task of outreach astronomy, trying to reach as many people as I can. Well, one of the things that the Year of Astronomy focused on is something I've been interested in for a long time, which is dark skies awareness. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the Dark Skies Project and how regular people can participate in that? Sure. As civilization has been coming up, night skies have been getting lighter and lighter and lighter due to the advent and the use of night lighting. People tend to use lighting at night in a very, very sort of interesting but not really direct way that they need to use lighting. We see it used architecturally as a way to highlight tall buildings in downtown areas and cities. We see it used often to illuminate areas around cities in an effort to make them safe. And there are some other decorative uses for lighting, uh, but we, what we do with it essentially is we try to make the night as bright as we possibly can so that we can navigate around and so that we feel safe, okay? One of the things we've learned, though, is that having extra light doesn't really deter crime, especially light that shines up toward the sky. And it's also a great waste of, a tremendous waste of energy. Of course. So one of the things that has been suggested to be done through organizations like the International Dark Sky Organization is to try to get people to realize that the better thing to do is to use certain kinds of lighting designs called full cutoff lighting fixtures. And these are fixtures that actually take that light and direct it down to the ground. Now, anybody can participate in a program like this to get the lumens that are being thrown away at night focused down on the ground where that light really can be helpful. So full cutoff lighting fixtures are available at any of the home improvement stores, and you can always go online and find out more about this. Well, as it turns out, one of the most important side benefits of this is that we are beginning to reclaim the natural resource that is our night sky at night. So I see it this way. In urban areas where there is so much night lighting, it's a real challenge to see some of the, some of the best deep sky objects or objects that should be available to the naked eye just because there's too much light. Well, if we can redirect our lighting to the right place, a couple of things happen. Not only do we get the light where we need it, 
but we improve our ability to see what's there to be seen in the night sky, even around in an urban area. What actually happens when we don't pay attention to this, I have found, is that there are generations of children that grow up in urban areas that aren't really aware of everything they can see in the night sky. Mm -hmm. So they don't learn about the basics, uh, you know, like constellations. Big and, Dipper, North Star. Uh, all right, all those kinds of things. They don't learn about those things. And it also curtails people from suggesting to them that they consider careers in astronomy and space science, since what happens is that adults who don't understand what's going on say to them, well, you know, you can't see anything at night anyway, so why bother going out? Right. And that's a really bad attitude to take because a lot of fantasy and dreaming about what can happen in the future seems to be connected to people's sort of sojourn around the night skies under a clear, dark sky. It opens the door for all kinds of imaginative thoughts. And so if we can provide that resource again, then kids might start to dream and think about things like that again, as, as well as adults too. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about kids and, and space fantasies. I mean, so many kids want to be astronauts. Mm. And obviously yes. there are very few job openings in that field. Yes. But a lot of those kids could wind up in space-related science jobs. Uh, they could be astronomers, they for example. They certainly can, sure. Um, so if you're a parent and you have a kid that's got those astronaut dreams, what advice would you give that parent or what resources would you direct them towards to sort of maybe nudge the child gently into a space-related science field while you know, not completely destroying their dreams of being an astronaut? Well, that's a really great question, and I'm glad you're asking it at this point because I've done some work just recently with high school students, parents, and teachers that identify with a career of being an astronomer or an astrophysicist. And it's very much the same, as you pointed out, about being an astronaut. So those two positions, the astronaut and the astronomer, astrophysicist, are at the tip of the pyramid of a huge support team that makes all that stuff happen. So there are plenty of associated jobs connected to that one little piece at the top of the pyramid. So the astronaut can't go to space without hundreds of thousands of people that create all of the infrastructure and engineering for that person to be able to make it into space. And Patrick, it is everything, everything, everything from steel fabricators to rocket engineers to seamstresses that make the spacesuits that protect them from the nasty environment of space to the chemical engineers that devise all of the fuels and all of those kinds of things, the computer programmers and software engineers and all of those people that all go into making everything that the astronaut is going to need to stay alive in space. So what's your advice to the parent in terms of guiding the child there? Yeah, my advice to the parent is that the parent should encourage that child to do everything they're interested in related to space science and mathematics and physics and science in general and let the child develop its natural interest in that direction. Don't worry about the career aspiration at this point because guess what? If your child aspires to be an astronaut then what you should do is you should motivate that child to follow through with all the math and science courses necessary all the way up to the point of applying to be an astronaut and guess what? If the child fails at becoming an astronaut Think of all the incredible training that's gone into that child's education. Of course. So that person now has this great skill set that they can use to do any of the other jobs that are related to that. Anything that follows their interest. And who knows, along the way, they may decide that, well, maybe space travel isn't for me, but I'd like to be one of the engineers that controls the rover that's out on the planet Mars. If I told you the story of how that person got to be the rover driver on Mars, you'd really clearly understand. And I'll just briefly say, that person started out in a video training course at a school here in Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Yep, worked their way through that career, and it opened a door to become a rover driving engineer. That's great. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. so when Lyft finally gets to Mars, this, this person can... Shuttle be people all around on the rover. With the autonomous rovers, you <laughs> bet. That's exactly right. But that's the, that's the same career path 
track idea mm -hmm. that anyone, any child, any student, any parent of a student, any teacher of a student interested in astronomy can follow the same path. And the reason why I emphasize this, Patrick, is that often in astronomy what we hear is, how do I say it, um, sometimes people in astronomy try to discourage students coming into the field not to pursue it. Again, because there are so few jobs, okay. not many jobs available, lots of postdocs running around with no positions available for mm. them. But it's not about the job. It's really about your interest. Right. That's what it's about. It's about what motivates you to pursue these topics. That's, what it's, what, that's what's important because if this path isn't open, as we spoke about with the astronaut, other paths will open that you could find just as satisfying, if not more. And those, those kids uh, could make great discoveries. Oh my gosh, can they make great discoveries. It's not always made right at the top of the pyramid. No, and, and actually this is something I wanted to talk to you about. So, you know, 100, 150 years ago, some of the great advances in science were made by regular guys who were just, they wanted to know how the world worked, they were just noodling around, and they discovered amazing things. Sure. Um, and now we live in an era where Bill Nye the science guy is attacked because he's not a real scientist. Um, <laughs> yes. do, do you have your real scientist badge with you today? Did you, uh, is it in your other pants? Wait a minute. Uh, I, I have a tattoo right down here. Uh, okay. All right. We're just, we're going to take that as, okay, as okay. red. Well, just assume um, I have we'll, it. We'll, yeah, we, yeah I'll, I'll trust you on that one. Thank you. Thank you. But, um, you know, my question for you about that is today, um, one of the things I like about your field is that it embraces citizen scientists. And I wonder if you could talk for a little bit about maybe a big discovery that a citizen astronomer made and talk about how regular amateur astronomers can contribute to the work that you professionals do. So amateur astronomers have been doing exactly that for quite some time. Most people don't realize it right now, these days I should say, but uh, more uh, prior to this decade, uh, say like the last 15 years or so, comet discoveries were made by amateur astronomers using binoculars who became very familiar with a small set of constellations. And what they do is with those big binoculars under dark skies, they would sweep those few constellations every night, every night, looking for something that they knew shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And that's how comets were discovered. And UFOs and other things like right. that. But we'll, get those, we'll let those go for right now. But that's how comets were discovered. I met a 13-year-old girl six years ago who discovered a new type of supernova that had never been identified before. Wow, what's it called? Well, I can't remember the name of it. Supernova. No, I mean, the, the, what oh. type of supernova? Oh, oh, it was a special kind of supernova that, uh, that had a special kind of cycle of explosion and then uh, retraction, a little bit more explosion, a little bit more retraction, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Something that had never been seen before. And she did it through a citizen science project in which she was learning how to compare galactic structure so that she could look through a series of photographs and be able to identify galaxies of a particular structure. Well, as she was going through the, this huge pile of photographs mm. of galaxies identifying their particular classification and structure, she saw a bright spot in one of the galaxies and thought, hmm, Oh, that doesn't look like it should be there. So she sent her discovery back up the chain that she was working through and now is identified as one of the discoverers of that particular type of nova. So now anytime a research astronomer or astrophysicist refers to that nova, they have to include her name as an author on their research paper. Nice, that's fantastic. And 13 years old. 13 years old. And the backside of this is that She's not really interested in becoming an astronomer, but she was into it for that period of time. Mm -hmm. For a couple of years after that, she really wants to do something else. But I think that's a really great example of how everyday regular people who just have an interest in something can make significant discoveries. There's another really good example of this. There was an astronomer named Milton Humason. Milton Humason worked with 
uh, Edwin Hubble. Okay. When Edwin Hubble in the early 1900s, 1920s I should say, was discovering the true size of our universe mm -hmm. and the real number of galaxies, the guy that he worked with was Milton Humason. Milton Humason started at Mount Wilson Observatory as a janitor ah. and worked his way up to become Hubble's partner. That's so fantastic. The greatest discoveries in the universe are made by the guy that has the name and his research partner that didn't have a degree. That's great. So there are lots of opportunities for people still, especially you'll find opportunities for people to make discoveries in astronomy through, believe it or not, astrophotography, which has taken a huge step forward for amateurs considering the kind of digital imaging technology that's available today. Amateurs can create images that are not very far at all from the quality of the most professional observers uh, working at the best instrumentation anywhere else in the world. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, as a cynic by nature, yes. I, I, I want to yes. ask you sort of about the dark side, the flip side of that question. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> Here we so, go. So, you know, it used to be back in the day in the, in the Western world that science was beholden to the church. I mean, everything was beholden to the church. Yeah. And if you had a scientific theory or idea that didn't conform to what the church taught about how the world should work or how the universe was, mm -hmm. um, you might expect the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> um, and in today's modern scientific community, is there enough room for skepticism or do you find that the community has kind of imposed its own orthodoxy where people with novel or unusual theories are sort of marginalized and, and pushed to the side? Well, that is a really good question. As it turns out, that scientific research world and structure is still highly restrictive. And it is highly restrictive in the sense that it requires that people that work in that field operate by a certain set of agreed upon disciplines that, re that require one to present work that is as objective as it can possibly be and is open to review by any of your peers anywhere around the world. And so in the way that the scientific method works, that provides a really good check and balance system to make sure that your work is as clean as it can possibly be. So in that sense, there is a kind of orthodoxy. It doesn't mean that any, that just, it, it doesn't mean that someone can't get into that, into that, you know, sort of like reg highly regarded field one can do that, but one has to go through all of that sort of training to get into that position of acceptance. Now, it's not to say, it's, it's also not to say that science doesn't have room for uh, alternative ideas to be presented. There is room for alternative ideas to be presented, but that work won't necessarily be widely accepted or acknowledged unless it can stand up to that kind of rigorous examination by peers in your field. So given that, you could say that science does have a little bit of room for this, but not for anything that's really outlandish. So for example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out onto you know, the gangplank here, out okay. over the edge of the I ship won't push a little you. bit, okay? And it regards it regards UFOs, okay. unidentified flying objects. Now, I have to be really, really, really careful here because if I begin to stray into territory like that, people begin to question my credibility. Of course. But I just want to use it as an example. It has to be that there can exist flying objects that are unidentified simply because we may not have enough information, data, visual data, anything like that, that would allow us to actually identify what that flying thing was. Sure, it could be a test flight of a new kind of spy vehicle that the U.S. is producing that we don't know about. Sure, it could be all kinds of things like that that we simply aren't aware of. Our knowledge level isn't high enough, we, we're not privy to inf all those kinds of things. That's not to say that they are alien spacecraft. Right. However, it's very, very difficult for the science community to allow for investigation, real investigation presented by real 
actual vetted scientists that have a reputation just to try to identify what those unidentified objects might be. That's one of those regions that is verboten for mm -hmm. scientists to get anywhere near for fear that their credibility will go right down the toilet. Now, my argument often is about things like that. Well, if you, if you believe in the scientific method and the way in which we conduct scientific research these days, then doesn't that mean that, that any field is open for examination by legitimate scientists doing real work without fear of uh, you know, being blacklisted? And uh, it would be nice if that were the case. <laughs> but part of the reason why that isn't the case is that research dollars are very, very hard to come by. Sure. There's way too much competition for the scarce amount of money that is available for quote-unquote legitimate research. So that tends to color what happens in that realm. So what we find is we find that there are sub-professional levels of concentration about certain kinds of sciences that are not necessarily seen as legitimate science. Well, I mean, let's talk about a, a related topic. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be that if you said, uh, I think there's life outside of our planet, that that was just career suicide. You were a lunatic, <laughs> you were done. Yes. You know, don't yes. let the door hit you in there the ass are aliens, on the way out. Little green men running right, around. Right, right, sure. right, right. Yeah. And, and now I feel like we're at the point where it's acceptable to say um, there's a possibility of life outside of Earth. You know, statistically, looking at the number of galaxies and planets, we think it's, it's, it's a possibility. It could be. But is it still career suicide to say, I do believe that there's life outside of Earth? It's no longer suicide because okay. there's an entire field now of astrobiology. And the field of astrobiology looks at what the possibilities for the development of life in other places around the solar system and the galaxy and the universe might be given that uh, there are so many possibilities for environments where, environments like ours that could develop someplace. So we can't discount the possibility that this could happen again. So it's not career suicide anymore, but one has to be careful to focus away from anything that appears to be related to what we might have seen in a science fiction movie from 1950 to 1980. All right, well, let's, let's talk about science fiction. Um, science fiction has popularized the concept of the multiverse, the idea that there are infinite alternate universes where uh, there may be tiny differences or enormous changes. Um, you know, there could be a universe where you are a vampire and I am an astronomer. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, good storytelling aside, what does actual real science have to say for or against the existence of a multiverse? I got to tell you that the developments that have taken place in cosmology over the last 15 to 20 years have pointed to this really interesting possibility. And the interesting possibility goes like this. If our universe, as we see it today, actually is the result of what we think of as a Big Bang explosion at the very beginning, mm -hmm. followed almost immediately by this intense period of explosion called inflation, where the universe suddenly expanded and then cooled down. And we had you know, the possibilities for knots of density to develop into galactic clusters and things like that. If we believe that the Big Bang, as it's being described today, actually did occur, then it requires the existence of multiple universes. Ah, right. Most people don't get that part of it, that it requires the existence of multiple universes. All right. So now, of course, the question is, well, how do we see these multiple universes? What can we learn about them? Well, the problem is that we can't learn anything because so far we have no information that comes to us from any of those other universes. They are outside our own. Now, when you say multiple universes, are you talking about infinite, an infinite number or just, you know, more than a couple, but we don't know how many? Oh, more than a couple, but we don't know how many. So when we think about that, we have to think of it in terms of, are we talking about universes that are outside the boundaries of our universe as we understand the term boundaries when we talk about infinite space and things like that? 
And the answer is probably yes, as opposed to saying that there's another universe that fits right in here exactly where we are occupying the same space, but in a different wavelength so we don't see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, if you wanted to get really wild, you could say, well, it's possible that there could be another universe right in here ingle, intermingled with us. It's just that the physics are slightly different and therefore we can't detect or see it. But you're really stretching your imagination to say something like that. But I don't know that that's any different from saying that there are multiple universes outside the boundaries of our own as we know it to exist today. Okay. Food for thought, certainly. It's one of the great things about uh, trying to understand the universe is ooh, if there was this much knowledge to be had about the universe, we know about this much right over here. So there's plenty of blank to be filled in. Well, here, here's an interesting blank to be filled in. Okay. Um, since the mid-1800s, there's been a theory about an object called Planet X. Mm -hmm. And this theory has widely been derided almost since the person who came up with it, uh, you know, spoke about it. Yeah. Although, interestingly, it did lead to the discovery of Pluto. Yes. So the search for Planet X gave us True. Pluto. Right. Um, now, you know, 150 or however many years it is later, NASA has said, you know, the existence of Planet X would actually explain some things that we don't really have a better answer for. Mm -hmm. And we haven't found it, but now we're kind of looking for it. Mm -hmm. um, is there some kind of object out there that's perturbing the orbits of the outer planets? Ooh, and is it coming to land on our planet and well, gobble up I, all I the humans? Well, I think we can safely like... say it's not going to we'll be... We'll take that uh, out of the picture. We'll take okay. that out of the picture, but... One of the things I love about uh, astronomy is that often there is an intersection between fantasy and real science. And that can happen because we have such an incomplete picture of the universe. Sure. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, David Levy, who was an amateur astronomer and comet hunter uh, that's pretty well known in the business, said at one time uh, that the universe is still under construction. Specifically, he said the solar system is still under construction. And he was referring to an incident that happened about 25 years ago now where Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 crashed into the planet Jupiter, and there were 26 individual pieces of the comet that crashed onto the surface. We'd never seen anything like that before, expected that something like this couldn't really happen, and there we could see it, and David said, solar system is still under construction, folks, let's not forget that. Well, as it turns out, we don't know all of the members of our solar system. We do not know the entire membership. So when someone comes up with the idea of an additional planet out there somewhere, out in the dark, we haven't detected it yet, but it's influencing things. Well, that comes across from a couple of different disciplines that are both scientific and not scientific. But if we were to say, no, that's impossible, that'd be a really poor display of scientific curiosity. Sure. Because if we don't know what's out there, how can you say it's not possible for it to exist? But what we have since discovered, as our instrumentation and tools have gotten better and better and better, is that not only do we not know, but we suspect that there's more out there than we thought. And one of the things we've been able to get a little bit closer to is identifying the possible existence of an actual object of a certain size and mass and potential distance that could be answering some of the questions about the behavior of some of the most distant planets in our solar system. And that then at least gives us a chance to plop down a marker that says, you know, we could answer all these questions if there were an object like that. And guess what? You know, we feel like there's something out there. We can feel it tugging. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there it may mean that our instrumentation simply has to get better. Right. And that's the only way that we've learned more and more and more about the universe is by making our instrumentation better, being able to gather more data so that we can find out that something is either there or not, but at least we have a marker now that says, here's what we should look for. Well, let's talk about something else that may either be there or not, depending okay. on who you're talking to. Uh -huh. uh, there's a show called How the Universe Works, and the host, uh, Mike Rao, caused uh, a bit of a row last year <laughs> uh, because he said uh, black holes, we can't really prove that they exist. He said there are effects we can observe 
that are best explained by the existence of black holes, but we can't actually prove that they're there. And a few years ago, Stephen Hawking said, black holes, as we currently understand them, don't exist. They're, they're much more complex and nuanced than the way we look at them now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a principle, well, a law of quantum mechanics that says information has to be preserved. It can't be destroyed. But if you have a destructive event horizon around a black hole, that would seem to contradict that, that law of quantum physics. And finally, there was just a paper published by some Belgian researchers that said what we think of as black holes are actually wormholes, and they don't have this destructive event horizon around them. So how sure can we be that black holes really exist and that they have this event horizon? Right now, what we know and understand about how stars behave toward the end of their lives indicates that stars of a certain mass, uh, beyond a certain mass, actually have this really weird thing that happens in that they collapse in on themselves with such an intensity that you no longer can actually visually see or visually detect what was once a very large star. But you can still sense the effect of its gravity that comes from that mass. And that's, that's pretty well proven. The idea that we can't prove the existence of black holes can only be directly connected to, that idea can only really dire be directly connected to the fact that we might not be able to quote unquote see it in visible light. But we certainly know that there are objects of very, very high mass that are having extraordinary effects on everything else around them, including any kind of electromagnetic radiation that should be able to escape and do anything else that normal electromagnetic radiation does. These objects don't allow that to happen. Whether we want to call it a black hole or call it something else, well, we can change the name all we want, but what we see is that effects that seem to be consistent with this concept that we've developed of this very, very dense object that won't allow light to escape, those seem to be not only uh, individually identifiable around our galaxy, but we've also been able to identify objects like this uh, of incredibly great size at the cores of galaxies because they demonstrate the same kind of behavior in a galaxy, at the core of a galaxy, as they demonstrate as individual stars in a more localized region. So it may be that black holes you know, are not really the way that we've been describing them today. I would like to think that Hawking, when he talks about things like that, is talking about the fact that we have only this minuscule amount of information and there's a lot, more, a lot more for us to learn about black holes. There's no question about that. And then the connection to white holes. You know, we know on paper that wormholes can exist. We know that they can exist theoretically, but for a very, very short period of time, and it takes a tremendous amount of energy to maintain them. So is it possible that black holes really are connected somehow to some other kind of thing? It's possible, again, because we don't really know enough yet. So we haven't answered all of the questions. It leaves the door open for lots of speculation that could go somewhere if there's enough reproducible data, enough testing that can be done to demonstrate what's true in reality. Because another thing that happens in astronomical research, Patrick, that everybody needs to understand is that scientists do a lot of what's called modeling. Mm -hmm. You create an entire universe in a computer through which you can run a number of iterations of what would happen in that universe if you change these parameters. Sure. Now with a very, very powerful computer, you can run billions of those calculations and see how billions of universes would evolve. And you could come up with one that shows that it could happen this way. Right. But one problem that exists in the astronomical research world is going with the model alone and not tying it back into reality. So I can come up with a scenario that says, yeah, we can have black holes that work like this or wormholes that work like that. Great. Can I actually see that in the real world? Mm -hmm. 
It's got to be possible to see that in the real world for the model to mean anything. Right. So, while the models are great, I still got to go with what nature has shown me. Right now, nature says, yeah, black holes work. You don't understand everything about them, but you've got a good running start on them. With the event horizon? With the event horizon. Okay. But the event horizon, as it turns out, is not a place where stuff is getting destroyed necessarily. It is getting broken down into basic elementary particles. And when you actually start to look at black holes, what you find is they have these extraordinary jets of material that are blasting out of the rotational axes that's carrying the material from the event horizon away. So rather than thinking of it as something where the material is absolutely being destroyed, that information is either existing on the event horizon right at the edge of the singularity for time immemorial, or it gets blasted out along the jets, and that information goes out into, the, into nearby space or the surrounding galaxy. So if I'm understanding you correctly, and my, you know, I'm, I'm a layman in this field at best, um, you're saying there are things that, that actually get away from a black yes. hole's gravitational pull? Yeah, absolutely, pull? sure. There are particles that get away from a black hole, from, a, from the pull of a black hole. Sure, because as they're on that accretion disk, mm -hmm. nearing the event horizon, if they can get out along a magnetic field to those jets, then that information can get away. Some does stay there, but not everything stays there. Not everything gets away because at the event horizon, there is that point at which time is going to stop. Mm -hmm. So some stuff is stuck there. Right. But not everything is stuck there. I did not know something can get away from a black hole. So it can get is... away. I would not say, I would not recommend that we uh, <laughs> jump on a bicycle and ride right out there and get a good close look. I'm, I'm not going to go that far. Yeah, I think we need E.T. for the whole bicycle ride into space thing. And since he's not here, we'll have to forego that. But uh, I, would, I would propose a generational spacecraft that uh, takes some folks from uh, uh, a region south of Philadelphia, you know, in the Virginia area near the capital of the United States. <laughs> that we might send out on a first mission to investigate this. All right, well, let's, let's, let's talk about something that's going to annoy some of those people then. Great, let's do um, that. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, a story, a science history story. Okay. And I'm stealing this story from someone who I greatly admire, a man by the name of James Burke. Ah. And he did a TV series called Connections. Guys, if you have not seen Connections, when you're done watching this, Get on YouTube, go online, watch Connections. I agree with that, for um, sure. There were three series, Connections, Connections 2, Connections 3. They're all good, but the first one was best. So in Connections, James Burke tells this story about Baghdad in 765. And the ruler, the Caliph al-Mansur, was very sick, and nobody could figure out how to fix his problems. So they called for someone from a respected teaching hospital, and the man was well-versed in medicine and astronomy. And he came down from the mountaintop, as it were. Um, and the first thing he did was he made an astrological birth chart for the caliph. And uh, this was based on where different heavenly bodies were at the time of his birth. So Virgo was in the first house, and the sun was in the third house, and what have sure. you. Sure, right. And he, he does the chart, and he looks at it, and he says, wow, so many of these things are clustered in the first house, and that has to do with the stomach. So clearly, you must have a stomach problem. And he concocted a cure, and it worked. Wow. And so the caliph, of course, is very impressed. Sure. And he sends his scholars back up the mountain with this guy, uh. and they discover a trove of old Greek manuscripts and they start translating them into Arabic, and they learn many, many things that had been lost to history. Yes. And I bring that up. That's one story. There are, you know, are many others like it, but it's a snapshot in the history of astronomy, in the history of science, where during the Dark Ages, most of Western Europe, people are digging in the dirt. They're, they're just trying to figure out how to eat, how to get by, how right. to not die. Right. Um, and the Islamic world is in its golden age of science. And so much of what was learned about science then, and even so much of what we know about science today, is either material that the Greeks had written down, 
that was translated by Muslims and, and kept and preserved by them, or original discoveries by Islamic scholars during that time period. Talk a little bit about that time period and the importance of Islamic scholarship in astronomy in particular. One of the most important aspects about that is how the Islamic culture uh, conducted itself as it became so widely dominant across the region. The Islamic culture, when it went in to conquer another kingdom, wouldn't take away or destroy the other kingdom. What they wanted was allegiance to the Islamic life and worship of Allah. So what they would tell the country that they were going in to conquer was that, look, if you'll just change your religion over, we'll let you keep all of your cultural structure, we'll let you keep all of your everything else, we won't tear it all apart, and we'll also take what knowledge you have and incorporate that into our knowledge base. So they assimilated so much information from all across the region and it helped them to synthesize all of that into sort of this great science knowledge base that they could apply across a lot of different disciplines. And it included astronomy and medicine and mathematics and geometry and geography and all of these other different subject areas. And they would keep record of this. So one of, the, one of my most favorite aspects about Islamic astronomical study and research is that when you look at a map of the night sky these days, most of the names of the stars that we see are Arabic names. Now, they may be names that have been transliterated from Greek or Roman names, but typically they are new names that were provided by the Arabic culture to the stars of the constellations. So the constellation names themselves tend to be Greek or Roman, but the stars themselves have these beautiful Arabic names. So in Islamic culture, not only did they have incredible capability in terms of uh, mathematics, uh, in terms of understanding the sky, but their ability at mathematics and geometry in particular aided in their abilities as master navigators of the desert regions around the Middle Eastern area and really far into Asia. And so they could apply all of their knowledge of astronomy and mathematics, mathematics into a practical navigational tool that they could use to get around so much more easily than everyone else. This allowed them to have a really great understanding of how the sky was laid out and how to use every part of the sky for navigation, hence leading to a better understanding of navigation on the globe itself. I mean, they had zero before Western Europe had the concept Let's, of zero. The Arabic numerals that we all know, these all came into use and into focus and helped to strengthen and enhance their culture because they were willing to gather information from all those different cultures that they may have conquered to bring them all together into a body of knowledge that they could practically use. It's a, and you can see it everywhere. It's in the mathematics, especially. Algebra. Algebra is the perfect example. <laughs> but if you look at all the building structure and the artwork in the building, if you will, and all this, all of it is directly related to mathematics, related to astronomy, and that ability to absorb information from other cultures. So let's flash forward to the future and talk about uh, the Franklin Institute. So you, you're literally the voice of the Franklin Institute. Yes. Like, the museum is closing in 10 minutes. That's, That's you, That's true. Right? That's true. I do a lot of voiceover work for Franklin Institute. Are, now, are you still doing? I still do that, sure. So what's the most fun or strangest thing you've had to record for an announcement? Uh, I think probably the most fun thing I've had to record uh, might have been something that was used um, somewhere else. I think it... I, I want to say it might have been used as a, you know, at a, at a baseball game as an announcement about the Franklin Institute or something odd like that. Okay. There are so many crazy things that I get to do at the Franklin Institute. Uh, there's, there's more than one of those, actually. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, talk to us about what's happening at the Franklin right now. Sure. Very straightforward. At the Franklin Institute right now, we have an exhibit called Game Masters, 
which is 100 video games from the classic video games that we all knew and loved as kids up to a, a few rather modern uh, video games as well. You said video games? I did say video games. Do you get to play the video games? Yes, you can, and you don't have to put any quarters in the machine or anything like that. So if, if Space Invaders was your thing back in the day... Space Invaders was my thing. I oh. was a master at Space Invaders. Well, I, I was the guy that figured out you could shoot through your own shields and shoot the aliens by firing up through your own shields. That was me. I, I invented that as far as I know. You can come down and put your initials on the, on the, on the machines there. Awesome. So no quarters. No quarters necessary. Uh, you can just come in and pay the admission for it, and you can play all of the games for as long as you like. Ooh. Can I, can you, can you, can I come over for a visit well, sometime we can, soon? We can figure something out. We okay. Can, we can work out a deal. That'd be great. I would love that. I love, I'm a huge sure. old school video game fan. Oh, so. Come on down and join. When, when is the place not um, covered in kids? Uh, that's a really great question. So what you'll find is that late in the afternoons, Monday through Friday is a good time. Weekends are a big family visit time for Franklin Institute. Many people think that our biggest audience is our school visits, and that's true, but really our biggest audience is, is families on weekends and at holidays. So if you can come during the week or on a really beautiful sunny day mm -hmm. when everybody else has skedaddled off on vacation someplace else, particularly in the afternoon during the weekday, 2 o'clock on until 5 o'clock, you'll find the place is uh, pleasantly quiet. Okay, that's great. And if I recall correctly, the last time we, we kind of chit-chatted about the Franklin, you said there were some programs that were um, more geared towards adults? Yes, we have uh, several programs that are actually really wonderful extensions of the basic Franklin Institute experience, but they give some added dimensionality. One I'll mention is Night Skies at the Observatory. It's mm -hmm. a regular monthly program in which we have the observatory open for general public viewing. Uh, through our telescopes, you can see all kinds of great stuff through the telescopes in our, you know, at our place. The moon, the bright planets, those kinds of things, bright stars. And we have uh, great science lecturers on those evenings as well as a group of activities. And we have a cash bar up on the fifth floor roof deck ah. that gives you a great panoramic view of the city. So you can see two moons if you drink enough. Uh, if you're very careful and look in the right place, you certainly can. Uh, another program I mentioned is Science After Hours. This is a program that takes science topics of all different kinds and adds a really fun element of engagement for uh, the 21 to 35 crowd. Okay. So uh, we'll have dance parties in the planetarium. We'll have all kinds of really great activities. Ooh. And science topics range everywhere from uh, the Roaring Twenties to Harry Potter. And often people come in costume. So uh, it's a really great kind of experience to have in science at the Franklin after the school bus is gone. Well, that sounds fantastic. And you know, I am still actively DJing, so I'm just gonna, I'm not literally gonna throw my hat at you, but I'm yeah. throwing my hat in the ring. You know, I still do DJ quite a bit, so. Yeah. On, a, on a night of a full moon, we might have just the event for you. That would, that would be fantastic. I would dig that. So, um, anything else coming up on the horizon at the Franklin? Sure, going forward, you know, our big blockbuster exhibits are the ones that really uh, draw people in. Game Masters is the one for the summer. We did Terracotta Warriors last year. Coming up this fall is an exhibition about Vikings, and we're going to do what we can to help people understand the truth about Vikings. Uh, did, you, did you know Vikings didn't wear horned helmets? I did know that. Oh, very good. Yep. Okay, great. Yep. And they, uh, they didn't drink meat out of those helmets either. Uh, but we do know that Viking establishments were here in North America long before Christopher Columbus even thought about the possibility of coming here. Absolutely. They really got around. They, um, they traded with the Arabs. They traded with, um, I, I want to say they traded with the Far East. Is that correct? You should think about becoming a volunteer at Franklin just for this <laughs> exhibit. You sound like you have quite a bit of knowledge. Oh, well, you know, I, I was briefly involved with the Renaissance Fair. I, I, I was a co-founder of the Philadelphia Renaissance Fair. And so a lot of research went into creating the characters and the setting and the city. And um, our, our lead character was actually a Viking. So, you know, I, I had to do some, some learning. 
then you're about gonna the find topic. this you're gonna find this particularly interesting then. Yeah, I, well I think anybody from the Ren I'm not really from the Ren Fair set, but I think a lot of people from the Ren Fair set are gonna be all over that exhibit. You know, I'll mention uh, one other exhibit that I think is really exciting for people to learn about these days. It's a new one at the Franklin Institute, one of our new core exhibits. It's called Your Brain. And this is an exhibit that helps us understand how our brain allows us to interact with our everyday world in all kinds of different dimensions and ways in which we don't even bother to think about, yet our brain actually does for us to allow, to allow us to function as we do with all the different things that are happening around us in our world. Wow. I mean, there's, we, we don't have time. We have to wrap up, but there's a premise I wish we could spend time talking about, which uh, I've only recently become familiar with, but the premise is that language influences the way in which your brain processes the information that it takes in. And de depending on the language that you speak, depending on the, your, your first language, the language that you think in, it may affect how you perceive the world around you, how you process the stimuli that come into your mind. Um, hmm. but I'll sadly, bet there's a section about that in the exhibit at the it, Is there? There might be. There might be or there is. Let's invite everybody down to come check it out and peruse for themselves. Please come down to the Franklin Institute and check out this, this exhibit and find out if, uh, if that particular tidbit of information is in there. Uh, and even if it isn't, that sounds like an excellent uh, outing and it definitely is. something to learn about. For sure. So, um, we are out of time. I have one thing to do real quick, which is to make a music plug. So um, the fusion of country music and hip hop is nothing new. Some of my favorite bands like Big Smo and The Lax have been doing uh, hip hop music for quite some time. But uh, I'm especially fascinated by the fusion of a very pure musical art form, which is bluegrass and hip hop. And the undeniable leaders of that fusion are called Gangsta Grass. If you've ever seen a show called Justified, a uh, great show no longer on the air, but they did the theme song for that show. Uh, and you can find them online. They do an amazing cover of Cypress Hill's How I Could Just Kill a Man. Uh, they have a lot of wonderful original songs as well. This album may not be their most recent one, but it's the one with the title I love the most. It's called Rappalachia. Um, please check out Gangsta Grass. You can find them online very easily. I highly recommend them. Derek Pitts, thank you so much for being our guest today oh, on the my show. My pleasure, Patrick. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time when my guest will be photographer and journalist Kyle Cassidy.